All right, guys, I am super excited about this panel. I think we have all the uh, probably best AI researcher and practitioner uh, you know, on, on stage here today with us. Uh, so, I guess uh, I'll, I have a couple of uh, interesting uh, questions for you guys. So I, can, I think the key, uh, my curiosity is, you know, how do we really moving from the deep tech research area into industry application? Uh, but let's start first by maybe have like a short introduction uh, of yourself and very briefly talk about uh, what kind of AI research are you guys uh, working on uh, in your field? Uh, maybe Charles, James? Okay. So I um, started out in academics, uh, teaching uh, computer science and AI and robotics. And as you know, the goal is to extend the boundary of human knowledge uh, in academic research. Uh, we try to explore what is possible. And then I think in industry research, we try and take what we... Uh, what new result that universities are creating and also apply it to some practical problem. So I always like to say there's a power of the paper and the power of the product. And I think we actually need both. Uh, so um, I've enjoyed basically working not only on writing papers and hoping that someone else will make a product out of it and also working directly on the product. So I think a good, healthy partnership between research, uh, universities, students, uh, professors, and also companies uh, and investment and government together. All of those things, I think, are important to accelerate the technology. The reality is, uh, if technology doesn't change, then the future of the world seems very grim. But because technology can change and has new possibility, then I, I'm very optimistic about the future. That's very interesting. So basically, it's like a fine line to walk between the paper and the product, right? So you know, how do you achieve that is uh, you know, an interesting topic. Um, but the good news now is that um, so much information is accessible um, with online publications. And uh, when I was a professor, some of my students, I was shocked, had never been to the Carnegie Mellon Library. They find everything online. <laughs> it makes me a little scared when I think about fake news. <laughs> but uh, actually the same thing happens in academic publishing. We right now have peer review as a process to try to evaluate the quality of a scientific result. And uh, sometimes there's plagiarism or there's uh, false results that get republished. So uh, I think it's, it's a problem that's, that's very broad, but the, the good news is that if you're interested in almost any topic, it's available to you instantly for free, mostly, right now in, in R&D. So I think this is very, very good for the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tang? Hello, everyone. Hello, e hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tang Lung, so I'm a research scientist at Google Brain. So my research a lot is a lot about uh, building uh, uh, teaching machines to understand uh, language better. So I have worked on um, translation tasks and uh, teaching machine how to translate you know, into different languages, English to French, English to uh, German, Vietnamese, any languages, without uh, the scientists having, needing to know the language. We just build a machine to process a lot of the data and it can just learn to translate automatically any pairs of language that we have the data. And uh, I work also work on like, how to teach machine to read an um, article. You know, you read a Wikipedia article, you can answer questions about the Wikipedia articles. And uh, recently I worked a lot, a bit more on the uh, chatbot conversation. I think these are the very difficult topics. And uh, regarding about research and uh, applications, a lot of the time at Google Brain, what we do, we pick, we have just so many problems to solve. So um, um, we really have to think about the right problem to solve. And for us, uh, me and Quark, we really think really hard about picking the problem that have product indications. 
For example, 2015, we worked on translations and uh, we built a new technology. Uh, after two years, the technology get improvements more than what you have accumulated over the past 20 years. And uh, we, um, we're quite excited about those um, developments. Cool. Yeah, it's really some really cool technology or you know, result coming out of your lab. So, yeah. Uh, what about you, Huing? Hey, um, so I'm, an, I'm Chip, I'm an engineer at NVIDIA. Um, so researchers have very different priorities when they create models. Like they want models that can achieve some state of the art on some benchmark data sets. And companies, they care more about like models that can be productized and deployed in the real world. So um, our team develop frameworks and techniques to help bridge the gap between research and production. Yeah, interesting. So basically, you are the, the bridge bringing all the research results from other team to the product team. Yeah, so our team is more of uh, applied research. So we did research with production in mind, so production-oriented research. Great, thank you. How about you? So my name is uh, Preswav Nakov. I'm a principal scientist in the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Um, I work in the same area as uh, uh, Tank. Uh, so um, we are at a high level, we are trying to teach computers to understand human language. Um, and it's a very dynamic uh, field um, which develops very fast and uh, technologies change and people's attention changes all the time. So, so did mine. I started with uh, lexical semantics, just like trying to understand how to teach computers to understand the meaning of language, then moved into machine translation. I was doing also biomedical text processing trying to understand the huge room of, of medical literature and trying to understand, um, you know, what kind of uh, diseases uh, have what kind of side effects, you know, when you, when you use specific drugs and things like that. Um, then moved into machine translation, then moved into question answering. And uh, when working into question answering, I was working into question answering for community forums. You know those forums where people ask questions and there, there, there's a long list of answers. I was trying to understand which of those answers are actually good, right? And if I have a new question, can I use this as a database to, to answer this question? Um, and we had a good system. We deployed it uh, in Qatar. In, in, uh, we had two different deployments uh, in, in, in um, actual use, production use. Um, but then we realized that it's not enough to find a good answer. And this is something I think that it's also a problem for Google these days. I mean, not to mention Facebook and other companies. Um, in the old days, if I ask a question, if I have a query, it's enough to find answers somewhere on the web and you are done. Not anymore. Now you need to worry, is it true? Okay? And uh, so with the rise of big data, people started worrying. These, people, these days people worry about, is the data fair? Is it balanced? Is it biased in some specific way? And uh, people also started worrying, is it true? Is it trustworthy? So the, the three big Vs of, of big data uh, have been traditionally uh, volume, uh, variety, veracity, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, volume, variety, uh, velocity, right? And it has been proposed that veracity should be the fourth V. So this is a very, very big problem. Um, and uh, so yeah, this is how we moved into um, this fact-checking uh, kind of project uh, and, and uh, the, the problem of disinformation and fake news. And these days I'm more interested in using AI for good to educate people so that they recognize those things and don't really get affected by them. Yeah, I saw that uh, you have a really cool demo with the website. Do you have any plan to productionize it, make it become you know, like some commercial product for other companies or? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. This is why we, um, um, we have been collaborating, as I said, with uh, Al Jazeera RT, uh, IR110, Associated Press, together with Tech Mahindra, Metal Equit, and Vinova. Um, they have a lot of interest in commercializing this. So media, many media, we have presented this uh, earlier, like about a month ago in Amsterdam in a big media conference. There were 55,000 people. It's a huge one, right? We had a stand there. We got an award. Uh, everybody is very excited. I mean, the media companies see a lot of value in this. This is, this is for, for the purpose of self-monitoring or maybe monitoring others. And they want to understand how do we compare to others. Are we covering this topic too much? Or are we kind of more biased than those other guys? And things like that. Um, and, and this is one. A media market might be a little bit small because, unfortunately, media these days are not, you know, the the... 
social media companies are getting all the advertisement revenue and the mainstream media companies are in a difficult situation. So commercializing in that as area might not be so big. Um, if you have other ideas, you know, how, how to commercialize that, I'm glad to listen. So like if you want to prioritize the research and need GPUs, NVIDIA can help you. Uh, sure, I mean, you, never, you can never have enough GPUs these days. <laughs> cool, thanks, Vyslav. What about you, Anhung? Hi, um, so I'm Hung. I'm a director of VinAI Research. Um, I've uh, started out my career as academia uh, teaching in research in AI. Uh, this is actually a long time ago. Um, and then I've uh, moved on to, to various industrial research labs in uh, Silicon Valley Bay Area. And I've enjoyed playing soccer with the VDI co-founders. And uh, <laughs> it's really great to see you guys here. Um, and uh, now I'm back to Vietnam. Uh, my uh, last job was at uh, Google DeepMind. And I am um, uh, really excited to be here. Uh, really excited to be part of the next phase of uh, uh, AI development in Vietnam. Great, thank you. And uh, so, okay, so my first uh, question for you guys is, what are the biggest challenges you have faced when you're trying to bring your research work into you know, industry application and you know, some of the solution uh, that you have you know, for these challenges? Yeah. So maybe starting with James. So I've been working on robotics for 25 years. And uh, unfortunately, people have watched movies with very intelligent robots. And so the public has a very high expectation, even though uh, the technology is actually not at that level. And uh, another problem is sometimes it isn't that hard to make a demo, but it's very hard to make a product. And so that gap is, is always difficult. So we strategy is you try to first maximize capability and then you maximize robustness and performance, and then maximize the, um, the feasibility in terms of cost. So make it work, make it work well, make it work cheap. And that's the order that you should focus. If you try too early to optimize cost, sometimes you end up shooting too low. You don't get the jump in capability to actually uh, make something work. So you should first ignore cost and try to really make something, you know, highly capable, high performance, and then hopefully you can find out where you can reduce the cost. But it's very challenging and uh, difficult. And uh, actually one of the big problems in robotics, um, you know, I've been uh, doing conferences and many robotics researchers will show a video. The problem is the video is the one time it worked, <laughs> right? And there's 99 other failures that they don't show. And, uh, and so it makes it very difficult from a company. Um, I sometimes would get excited about a result and I would show it to an executive and the executive would say, that's not so interesting. I saw a video of that 10 years ago. But I would say, no, no, this actually works consistently, 100% of the time. You know? And so that is a very, very big challenge. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you. I think that's, you know, a lot of robotics company out there kind of, you know, uh, ruin the expectation, especially of the consumer. You know, they, the consumer expect robots to do everything under the sun. And we're like, no, 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 it's not the case, right? Unless you want to pay like a couple million dollars for like, you know, like Asimo, for example. And even then, Asimo doesn't do much at all. So, uh, but yeah, fascinating. What about you, Tang? So, um, in my research, my, uh, my philosophy is to, um, to do something simple that can scale, can scale well uh, with large data, you know, uh, with more resources. So uh, a lot of the time, our work, you know, we don't want to be novel just for the sake of novelty. We think about um, simple things, simple things that work. And a lot of the time, you know, if you have simple things that run 10 times faster, you will get things way better when you have more data. So that's what we've uh, been doing for a long time. 
for example, when we build a question answering system, um, um, I can also talk a little bit about technical here. Like um, we take an existing system that using like LSTM, which process work one work at a time from left to right, and that's pretty slow. And we replace that with a new technology called transformer, where you can process all of the work all together, and that you get ten times faster. And then we get a very good system for question answering. So that has been uh, my philosophy: do something simple. I also advise a lot of students and people, you know, don't just try to think of complicated solution just for the sake of like novelty. You know, go for simple things first. Yeah, and I think especially with the uh, Google infrastructure, right? You know, you have like massive data set, massive computing powers. Sometimes the simplest approach would actually can leverage these much better. So great. What about you? Um, so. We actually work with a lot of companies trying to bring the research production, so I have a lot to say about this. Um, so we focus on natural language processing and speech recognition problems. And I think there are three main problems in trying, like that we see in trying to bring research into production. So first is data that you already, like, you already said about it. Um, so in research, you work with very clean and standardized data sets. But in real world, you might have to spend the majority of your time like, collecting data, clean data, and uh, it's very expensive. And the data set, I think the data might not uh, be even like, nearly as good as the research data. The second thing is the interpretability. So in research, you develop models to reach really good performance, which might mean that the models are very complex and you don't know why it makes certain decision. But in production, you care about interpretability. For example, if you build a um, system to predict whether somebody deserves a loan, like that, that client, if you say no to that client, they, they need to know why they are rejected the application. So it's very, so a lot of companies, they have to trade off uh, performance for interpretability. So they use a simpler model like AGBoost instead of like neural network, just because you can explain to clients better. And the next thing is, um, is alignment interest between the research, researchers and engineers. Researchers um, are like uh, between research and business uh, performance. So a good model performance doesn't necessarily mean um, a good business performance. For example, um, I think I read recently about a company that um, did very well in predicting like customer intentions. So when they go on their website, they see that, oh, so, so users see that, oh, um, they know that I'm going to Italy. They suggest immediately like, how to book a ticket to Italy. And the user's like, oh, that's really creepy. Are they like stalking me? So sometimes some models perform really well and users in misinterpret it as like you're stalking them, which is not good. It's very interesting. So how do you balance between all these three things that you're talking about, right? You know, data with interoperability and then performance. Are there like a ranking prioritization between the three or is it kind of like, you know, business results always, you know, trump everything else? So I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with what what the company exactly wants. Do they want to like establish really, like a reputation? Do they want to be the top research lab, or do they want to have product? Uh, so what are they um, product, what are they um, optimizing for? Uh, another thing is um, you have to do a lot of testing. So you have a model, and you need only have to like have users to use it first and see how users react to it. Um, so testing, I think this is one thing that. Uh, I feel like researchers don't spend enough time on is to test the model to make sure that uh, it's safe, it's interpretable, um, it's not doing anything weird that um, users don't, don't do. Yeah. Just want to add one thing. I think interpretability is very important. It's that I think like for self driving car, right? You want to know like how is the, the car making decisions, like whether it's seeing a, a pedestrian, um, you know, crossing the, the road or, you know, in the healthcare, how they make the decisions, like how do the AI decide if a patient had cancer or not? How about you, Prislav? So, um, on the, I first want, want to add a note about uh, um, interpretability. Okay, is it better? I hope so, okay. So, I first want to note about um, um, interpretability. So this interpretability, there's also explainability. So I, I guess that interpretability is more like for you as an engineer, as a developer to understand if the system fails, why it fails. And 
to be able to explain to the user or kind of, you know, to, 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 to your software engineers, you know, to your team to go and to fix it. But um, I think that explainability is, is something that is uh, um, more important to, from a user perspective. Uh, for example, I, I gave an example. Um, in, the, in the news aggregator that we have, it tells you, oh, this, this uh, article is so likely to be propaganda. Okay. So we have been uh, working with, with uh, journalists. They say, okay, if you tell me this is 84% likely to be propaganda or fake news, what do I do with this number? What do I do with this number? Right? But if you can click there and then show you, okay, highlights, okay, here's a propaganda technique. See, he is trying to scare you. There's a pill to fear here. And he's name calling, and he is this and he is that. Then, you know, you can understand why this decision was made, right? And, and this is something that is very important. So, um, we are scientists. I'm coming from a research institute. We don't necessarily focus on products, and often people focus on, on the research papers. Um, and uh, of course, we have been doing technical transfers. We have been talking to local stakeholders, to local companies. But um, so when about two years ago we started this project that I have uh, shown you, uh, it was a big change in the way that uh, you know that I work, and also a big change in the way that people appreciate what we do. Because before that, we had like a lot of cool publications that probably 50, if you're working, maybe 100 people are going to learn, to read, and that's it. Um, so I think it's important to have, um, to be able to show to people what you do, okay? And, and uh, so we have made the decision in our institute to start a specific project where we are working towards a specific application, in our case, a news aggregator, that is going to raise awareness, is going to make people understand, you know, the biases, you know, the factuality of different media, and, and kind of, you know, give, give this all, all explainability and so on and so forth, with the help to educate them, something like AI for good. But at the same time, we have exposed all these technologies as APIs. And then we are doing a lot of research. The moment when the research is somehow stable, we are trying to put it into the actual demo. Why is that? Well, because then business can appreciate. Then they can see it. If I just say, oh, we are doing this and we have, I don't know, whatever numbers, they are not going to be, uh, you know, very, uh, very impressed. And the thing is, then you can get feedback. Then they can... Uh, you know, try it. Then they can really understand what you're doing, and they can see different uses for this technology. Yeah, I guess in, in the fake news area, right, you know, yeah, being able to explain to the user, then will make them believing. Otherwise, they were just like, you know, questioning what you're saying, right? So, great. But do you, do you think um, that if you make it very easy for people to understand how you make the decisions, people can game the system? This is a very good question. And um, so, um, okay, the question is, well, if you tell people how your system works, then aren't they going to gain the system? Um, I would argue that this is not um, so easy, and I can even make a bold statement that it's not possible in principle, okay? So let me, let me kind of, I, 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 during my presentation, I said that I see spam uh, as, okay, fake news as spam on steroids, okay? And I have been talking that, okay, one difference is that spam is not viral, right? Fake news is viral, and so on and so forth. I also expect that fake news is going to go the way of spam, Spam was a big problem, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. It's not a big problem anymore. I expect the same to happen to fake news. Now, um, the thing is, suppose that I have a spam filter and you ask me how does it work? And I tell you, well, we look for simple language, we look for, I don't know, mentioning some doors, we need, okay. Or maybe we, we look for uppercase letters. You say, big deal, I'm not going to use uppercase letters anymore and you're not going to detect me. Okay, so you can gain the system. But if I tell you, look, I'm looking for the use of specific propaganda techniques. Now, it's not an option not to use them. I'm sorry, it's not. Because if you, if you go and you remove them all, it's not going to make anybody angry. It's, not going, it's definitely not going to be viral. It's not going to work. It's going to be what people think when they're talking about fake news. They are thinking it's false. It can still be false, it doesn't matter. Right? It's not going to be viral. It's not going to serve the purpose. So if you have a good AI that is actually looking at the very weak of propaganda, you just cannot do it without those, those things. So there's no easy way around it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for stuff. How about you? I think. Hi, um, so I think that uh, was a great question. Um, in my current job, I uh, actually have to think a lot about the connection between research and uh, commercialization in product. Um, 
And I, I actually also I have to think about that from a management point of view as well. So um, I think it's good to um, take a perspective that if you be able to transfer anything from research to product side, um, it's actually done by a group of human beings. So the human factors are quite important. Um, and that's also true in terms of the culture of how you're going to set up the organization and so on. Um, so I think back in the, you know, in the US, uh, usually uh, there's quite a bit of a separation between uh, how research scientists work and how the engineers work. And sometimes the scientists don't think very highly of the engineers and vice versa, right? Um, so that actually creates some problems. Uh, I think here in Vietnam, um, um, we don't have a lot of presence on the research, research side. So the very first thing that I uh, found out I actually have to do is to explain to people uh, even the need for research, right? Because um, I have to explain to people that if you don't invest in uh, the novelty angle, then uh, you're probably left with you know, um, a tool that uh, as a result of just fine tuning some you know, off the shelf open source uh, code, and uh, perhaps you can actually very quickly get to 80% accuracy, but you never be able to get to 90% accuracy. And uh, perhaps if you do that, then uh, you'd never get to own any IP at all, right? So all these things, uh, uh, I need to actually educate people about this, right? Um, and, uh, but, but then there's an advantage because uh, I'm building a lab from scratch, right? So there's no pre-culture they have to deal with, right? So the way that I'm setting it up is that, uh, well, obviously you have to realize that, well, there's a need for both two DNAs. Um, the scientists who sort of like, you know, preset on going to after things that are really challenging, um, techniques that that's not even there and try to improve the state of the art. Um, and also care a lot about proper and thorough evaluation, right? And then there's the engineering, engineering side, which obviously is very critical from taking um, you know, making sure that things are robust and making sure that things, things are cheap, right, as, as James has pointed out. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think the first thing is that we just have to acknowledge that we need both two DNAs and uh, these people need to work together, right? Um, and uh, I think that, that's what I'm trying to do um, at VNAI. It um, started out as being a research lab, but at the moment we also gradually build up an engineering and applied team as well. So that's uh, very interesting. The separation between the researcher and the engineer is going to always be there, right? So who's going to dictate the next step? So at AI, I, I do. Oh, you do. <laughs> All right. Top-down approach. Oh, we work. So um, at some point, I was talking to um, um, how research is done in a company like SAP in Germany. And uh, they have mentioned to me that they have a very interesting model. So what they do is they take engineers from the engineering team and they put them together to work with researchers, right, so that they support them, but after two, three years, they move them back into the engineering team and they put other people there. The idea is that those engineers get to know what scientists can do, right, and then when they get back, they are self as the bridge. Those are the people that can speak both languages and have a very good idea about what is possible from the engineering point of view and what is possible from a you know, from the development point of view. And I think this is very important to have such bridges, not really to have hard boundaries between the two. Even like, even at Google Brand, we have a title called Research Software Engineer. So these software engineers also do research, and sometimes sometime they write paper, they are first authors, they're doing their research very well. Cool, all right, so next question. Uh, so AI is almost like uh, the hype, right? You know, everyone talk about AI, you know, you, everyone wants to have AI, but, you know, not many, not that many people truly understand about AI research and application. So uh, there are two parts of my question. The first is, how do you advise uh, corporation uh, to go about this, you know, picking the right AI, uh, you know, research and application uh, for their business? And then second is, you know, for the researcher, in order to pick the right uh, topics. Um, maybe start with James. So about uh, the time that the term artificial intelligence was being talked about, it was in the 1950s and 60s. But around the same time, there was actually another school of thought 
uh, called Intelligence Amplification, or IA. And um, in one sense, AI was, uh, it became replacing humans, but intelligence amplification was uh, enhancing human capability. And I think actually both of those are uh, important, but intelligence amplification, the thing I like about it is it really, it really speaks to making technology to help people. So you don't make technology just for technology's sake, you make technology that will contribute to healthy, healthy happy people. And uh, I think that is a way to prioritize from a, from a company point of view, investing in this technology. And then the second part is um, about, you know, the research today. I can say, I believe that right now is the best time in the history of humankind to be a researcher because um, even 15 years ago, if you wanted to do deep learning, there are only a few companies in the world that had the resource. So it was uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM. You know, when I joined Google and I, I had access suddenly to this cloud, it basically meant memory, disk space, computation was almost unlimited. And so it changes your way of thinking about a problem but only a few people had access to that resource. But now we have the public cloud. Even a small company can rent the cycles of memory, disk space, and CPU. Uh, you don't have to build your own data center in order to make progress. And most of the cutting edge research is open information or open source. So uh, anyone who has ambition, talent, creativity, a good idea can make an amazing impact. So right now is amazing. I sometimes wish I was a student again. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but uh, it's really an exciting time. So I think, uh, you know, initiatives that are trying to encourage and give people a chance to learn and improve their skill like Viet AI are very important to be a bridge. Oh, can I just go off a part that you said about now is a very exciting time to be a researcher. So I noticed that everyone on this panel is a researcher, and I'm the only one who's an engineer. And I could make the argument that now is the best time to be an engineer. So even though there's a lot of things going on in research, one thing I noticed that like two of the major problems in research is with the collecting and cleaning data, and the second with scalability. So you have to not only train the model on like one GPU, or one computer, you have to train it off to like a thousand of computers. So it's a very big engineering challenge to be able to build models to across those many uh, machines. So, and also I noticed that like a lot of researchers are not very good engineers, which means that even though the research are open source, the code can be really, really painful to work with. So every research lab will benefit a lot from having good engineers to make sure that their code is bug free and is scalable. I still remember who, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, how many of you actually on Twitter, can you raise your hand? How many on Twitter? Very few people. I, I advise people should go on Twitter to learn about AI, deep learning, and I, you should also follow Huing. I think uh, she's a very vocal voice on Twitter. I remember seeing one of your tweets that uh, asking, like, someone asked you, like, how many lines of code do you add per day, right? And I think her answer is a minus something, minus 100. So I think she was making a point that, you know, engineers don't have to write new code. There's also like good engineer who delete code, and that is more important. You make the code cleaner, you make the code easier to understand. And I really like that tweet. Cool, what about uh, uh, for the question, what are your thoughts on the uh, advice for corporate and you know. I can, uh, do we have to go in order or we can? Ah, uh, just jump in around. Yeah. Feel free to cut in, around. whatever you guys. So, um, what I'd like to say is that uh, from a research perspective, I think it's uh, very important to, um, to understand what is going on. So, the fact that there are so many open source uh, uh, codes, it's kind of makes it very easy to jump and to say, okay, I'm just going to take this and tweak it a little bit. And there are many people that do just that, right? And, and um, 
there, there have been, there has been a lot of, a lot of, I think it's important to understand what are the, the uh, limitations, what are the, 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 the ways that we can potentially fool ourselves because of flaws in the data. So Tang has been talk, talking about question answering. Um, you, know, you know better than me that you know, there are so many issues with the data there that, that for example, okay, there are data sets and oh, you do, I don't know how well uh, for this question answering problem. Turns out that sometimes you just delete the question and you just look at the answers and you can Pick the right one. What is this? Or sometimes you just look at the question and you know there's no need, for example, oh, how many? And then you don't even need to read the rest of the question. You know the answer is three. Why? Because this is how it is in your data set. So the, qu the thing is, there are many, many biases in our data set and we can easily fool ourselves. You know, if you just look into the specific algorithm, oh, let's try this fancy model, we need to sit down and need to understand whether this makes sense. And this is important to me put in research so that we don't fool ourselves, or oh, I have this paper that is like 3% better than yours, um, but it's even more important in industry, because if you de deploy this kind of system to the client and has all these kind of biases, that's not good. So I can uh, perhaps share with you some of the personal experience. Um, so I had to answer like a similar kind of question at Vingroup. So, uh, I, I think the strategy that I follow is very simple and it's also pretty standard as well. It's nothing um, uh, earth shattering here. We are looking at where the data is coming from. Uh, we are looking at where the company could actually have a competitive advantage in terms of data. Um, and Vint Group uh, is actually quite interesting because it owns an ecosystem that offers services that really uh, expansive, uh, ranging from uh, the homes that people live in, um, the supermarkets that people go to, um, the um, hospital, school, um, the luxury resorts, um, and now also the cars and perhaps the phones that people could be using. So I think that's a really interesting proposal um, if you could actually leverage the data, especially customers' touch points at that uh, level of coverage. Um, another thing that we looked at is um, um, because uh, the company owns the real estate, it actually owns a large network of uh, cameras. And from computer vision, computer vision point of view, it actually gives us you know, uh, plenty of data to work with. So. So, so I think it's, it's um, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, it boils down to simply looking at where the data is coming from and where they can actually leverage that for competitive advantage. You know, it's the source of data that it would be probably difficult for uh, other companies to, to have access to. Yeah, that's an interesting approach. I guess people say data is a new oil, right? And so, you know, you're just focusing on where the oil uh, reserve is going to be, so, yeah. So I'm just going to say, um, I think data being the new oil, we actually at this moment say labeled data is the new oil. Um, there's a big problem of uh, quality, quantity, and diversity. So uh, a lot of people focus on big data, they talk about quantity, how much data. But actually what we found is what matters a lot is quality and also diversity. So you want to avoid the problem of overfitting or bias in the data. So um, I think paying attention to di diversity of data and quality of data I think is very important. And accurate labeling is still an unsolved problem, how to do it well. And, and so now people are thinking about auto ML or you know, uh, training that can happen um, that's unsupervised. And, and, and uh, I think these are really exciting. So yeah, um, if you're interested in like working with uh, small data, you can uh, listen to my talk later on semi-supervised learning. Um, to answer third questions, I think I have a tip for corporations and uh, you know organizations. Uh, there's a very good course online, uh, AI for Everyone, by Andrew Ng. So I suggest like if you're a company or so startup, you know you have heard a lot about AI. You talk about AI, but you don't really know what AI is about. You should go and check that out. 
Because I think it's very important, um, you know, if you, you understand what AI is capable of, without really, you don't have to know the details, but if just that, you know, what are the current technology, what, is, what can it be good at, that can also link, bring a lot of values for the company, especially the CEOs, you know. I think, uh, I, think uh, I suggest people to take that course. Uh, I'd like to add something. Because uh, the original question was about advice to uh, academics, advice to practitioners. Um, I'd like to say that this all has to be part of a vibrant ecosystem. Otherwise, it's not going to work. This is especially important to innovation, especially important to startups. So if you want to have strong startups, you need to have strong engineers. Right? that can go there, that are really well educated. You need to have industry that is ready to take this to production. There has to be demand. And of course, if you want to have strong engineers, you need to have good education in the university. But now there's something that um, many countries don't realize. So uh, especially kind of smaller countries, they often think of, okay, so we want to have good applied research, right? We want to have good applied research because this is what really directly transfers to our economy. Um, but there's something that they often don't realize, and that is that if you want to have strong applied research, you have to have also, here and there at least, strong fundamental research. And the reason is, there have to be professors that are not looking into only what you should, could potentially put in, in the economy, in the product, in, in the next one year, or three years, or five years, but probably in the next 20 years, 30 years, why is that? Well, because somebody has to train the next generation of those professors that are going to teach you know, the students. And, and you need professors that are actually contributing, that are not just uh, on top of the things, that are not just current with the latest technologies, but that, that are actually creating them themselves. So kind of what I'm trying to say is, you want to also pay attention to the fundamental research. And the problem is that it doesn't really get you any direct economic advantage, right? But uh, it, it gets contribution to the overall ecosystem, to the overall economy in an indirect way. I think your point is an excellent segue to my next question. I was going to ask, you know, there's always like a tension between deep theoretical research that, you know, f f can have fundamental impact, right, to a few, but it takes a long time versus, you know, more practical incremental research work. And so I would like to ask for Vietnam, you know, uh, the environment, what would you think would be kind of like a better approach for Vietnamese universities and companies uh, between the two, you know, deep fundamental research versus more practical side? So I think we need both. Um, I think there's a price to pay if you take a shortcut. Um, I think there's a price to pay if you only care for if you care less about fundamental research. And that's because if you do that, then people will pay less attention to the quality of the research, right? So if you're a research scientist, your, your DNA is about the quality of your work. And if you care deeply about that, then you strive for fundamental research. I mean, that, that, that's clear, right? That, that's built into the DNA, right? So if we, I, I think if we don't um, pay enough attention to that kind of uh, research, then uh, we'll just, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to attract the best people, the best talents, right? and I think that's, uh, that, 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 that would generate some sort of ramification down the road. Any other, any other opinion? So I think I just want to answer the first question about like, um, so there's so much hype, so what advice do you give to companies when they want to bring research to production? I think the advice, uh, like what you tell our clients is that um, focus on the solutions instead of the techniques. So a lot of people just say, like, they hear on the hype, but, like, transformer models are so good, this is so good, and it's like, okay, you, but you don't, do you really need to use that? Do you want to use that in the company so you can, like, tell the press that you use that? Or do you just want to solve the problem you have? A lot of the problems they have actually don't need those fancy techniques. And a lot of just, like, it's very simple decision trees can, can solve their problems. So just focus on that. Great. Well, so uh, it's fascinating, but uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, do we have time for the audience to question? No? <laughs> All right. You know, thank you. The, the panel is uh, fascinating. You know, I, I, I learned so much from you guys, and, you know, I hope uh, you 
got some interesting insights as well. Uh, so please uh, join me and uh, give a round of applause to our panel speakers.